Welcome, all of you. I was expecting you, but upon my entrance into the studio from the hereafter, I became quite uh, alarmed, somewhat disoriented. Uh, the realization that I was to conduct a chat show in your time uh, gave me a sense of uh, hmm uncomfortableness, but uh, I, I promise you that I will rise to the occasion and conduct myself in a professional manner here tonight. Now, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with me and my work, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Calvert Fox, and in life I was a successful landscape designer and architect. Unfortunately, I discovered in the hereafter that I am not as well known as my longtime friend and collaborator, Frederick Law Olmsted. More about him in a moment. I'm certainly not as well known as my mentor and early collaborator, Andrew Jackson Downing. As you can tell uh, from my accent, or should we say what remains of my accent, I was not born here in the United States, but in London, England, in a neighborhood known as Pudding Lane. Well, it was in 1850 in London that I first met Andrew Jackson Downing. It was at an art exhibition and Downing was known as America's Apostle of Taste. I was instantly taken with the gentleman. Uh, he had uh, a way about him that was undeniable and one that I was uh, enthralled by. And I wanted to impress him, so I showed him some of my architectural drawings. He immediately offered me a position I was gainfully employed at the time, but I accepted the offer, and Downing and I crossed the Atlantic and ended up at his home in Newburgh, New York, where I was to remain for the next two years. It was there while working with Downing that I met a lifelong friend, Jervis McEntee, Hudson River School painter and his sister Mary. Mary and I married in 1854. And of course, Jervis asked me if I would design his home and studio, which I agreed to do. That was located on West Chestnut Street in Rondout, an area you know as Kingston. Well, as fate would have it, in 1890, that magnificent structure was purchased by local industrious Samuel Kirkendall, who then demolished the residence. The studio remained and was attached to the home next to Jervis's, and that home became uh, the property of Jervis's brother. Well, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I then uh, left this area and moved to New York City, where I would remain for the next 40 years of my life until my death in 1894. Almost immediately upon arriving in New York City and establishing myself, I met Frederick Law Olmsted, and we became friends and partners. Shortly thereafter, we were asked to submit a proposal for the design of a new city park. It was our plan, known as the Greensward Plan, that was accepted 
and the park which you know as Central Park was our design. Now I might add that Olmsted was a public figure, fairly well known. Interviewers sought him and he was more than happy to take full credit for our work, which was mostly my work. He was only interested in the uh, overseeing of the project. I was the one responsible for not only the landscape design of the 775 acres, but also of its major structures. As a matter of fact, Belvedere Castle and Bethesda Terrace, which are my work, are still standing, so I've been told. Well, Downing and I would have been friends for life, but Downing and his family and dozens of others were killed on a steamship, which was traveling on the Hudson River. The engine exploded and they were engulfed in flames. I do miss him terribly to this day. Well, even though I was in New York City and uh, working with Olmsted, I did uh, much work on my own. For example, I am the chief architect and landscape designer of Frederick Church's property at Olana in Hudson, New York. Of course, Church insisted on interfering as Olmsted did on the projects we shared, but I was the chief architect of Olana, and I'm happy to say that Olana has been fully restored and is now open to the public. Well, that's enough about me. I'm not here to talk about me, uh, something I'm quite uncomfortable with. My only concern is that I am not remembered in your day, but I'm here to present several historic figures. And it is my honor to interview each and every one of them for your benefit. So my first guest will be arriving shortly. And her name is Alice Astor. There's much more to her name, but you'll hear about that in a few brief moments. Thank you for your time and welcome to Voices from the Past. Good evening, Good evening Alice. Good evening. A pleasure to, to finally meet you. Yes, indeed. It is just a, a joy to, to have you join us today, uh, Mrs. Astor. I do hope my introduction was good enough for a woman of your esteem. Well, it was wonderful, Mr. Vox. And I'm only slightly amused that you chose to introduce me using all of my names. Well, is there anything else you'd like to be called? Well, you may simply call me Alice. Alice Astor Playdell Bouvery is the rather long inscription on my stone in the Rhinebeck Cemetery. But I am probably remembered by these names. <laughs> How did you acquire your names, Alice? Well. I was christened an Astor, and I took the name Playdell Boobery when I married my fourth and, and final husband. A woman in my day always took her husband's name. I don't suppose it's like that in this current century. Mm -hmm. so I was named Ava Alice Muriel Astor for my mother, Ava Lowell Willing. I chose to go by Alice early in life. How did you acquire um, the name Alice instead of Ava? Well, I don't quite remember why I chose Alice. Perhaps it was because it was the only name that was truly my own. Names are funny things, Mr. Vox. They can individualize someone, or they can also indicate that someone belongs to another person. Women of my time and class are remembered by their family names or the names of the men that they married. We upper class, turn of the century women absorb names much as a sponge absorbs water. You know, Edith Wharton was alive in my lifetime and she said the following in her novel, The House of Mirth. It is so easy for a woman to become 
what the man she loves believes her to be. How profound. Well, I can't say that I can relate to the concept of, uh, of absorbing names, but um, what you're saying does make a bit of sense, especially to my son, Downing Box. How so, Mr. Box? Well, uh, the name Downing is not original to my son. It was the name of my mentor and friend, Andrew Jackson Downing, who was my partner in architecture and a dear, dear friend. Uh, but uh, this is kind of difficult. I, I just, I, he saw a great promise in me and by, by naming my son after him, naming my son Downing, I in turn saw promise in him. Oh, that's quite beautiful, Mr. Vox. Well, thank you, thank you. But this is not about me. Why don't we return to you? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your family and your childhood? Well, I was born on July 7th, 1902, to Colonel John Jacob Astor IV and Miss Ava Lowell Willing. My grandparents, I'll have you know, were William Backhouse Astor and the famous Caroline Lena Skirmerhorn. And why was Lena so famous? Some may say she was infamous. You see, my grandmother was known as the Mrs. Astor, and she was the ringleader, or more importantly, she was the gatekeeper of Manhattan social society. Mm. It was best to be on grandmother's good side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you have any siblings? Yes, I did. I had a brother, Vincent Astor. He was the exact opposite of my grandmother. You see, he was a, a rather troubled and awkward looking fellow and he had a terrible relationship with our mother. She was known to lock him in the closet if he misbehaved. My mother was another fiery aster, mm. another aster you did not want to cross. Mm. Tell us then about your relationship with your mother. Well, I spent most of my childhood living with my mother. You see, my parents divorced in 1909, which was something that married couples back then simply did not do. Although I myself did my fair share of divorcing. <laughs> I remember mother whisking me away to London right after the divorce. But father, on the other hand, remarried a woman much younger, younger even than my brother Vincent. Mm. She ultimately became what I suppose is called these days a single parent when my father died on the Titanic in 1912. Titanic? What is... Oh, you're not aware of the, the oh. Titanic, a magnificent ocean liner that struck an iceberg on its maiden voyage and sunk in 1912, killing over a thousand people, my father among them. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. Hmm. Well, that occurred 18 years after my death, yes. which is the reason I... Well, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. That, that just chills me. Well, well, um... Alas, I never knew my father nearly as well as I knew my mother. Well, let's get back to something you said that I find interesting and I hope our listeners will find interesting. You talked about, uh, let's see, you mentioned uh, a fair share of marriages and divorces. Indeed, Mr. Box. I guess you could say that divorce was a sport for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, when did you first marry? My first marriage took place in 1922. At that time, I married Prince Sergei Pantanovich Obolensky. Our daughter, Princess Sylvia Obolensky, shares a plot with me in the Rhinebeck Cemetery. And when did things go south for you and the prince? We divorced in 1932. 
A year later, I married an Austrian writer named Raymond von Hoffmannsthal. We married in Newark, New Jersey, which I guess I should have taken as a bad omen. You see, we, we divorced in 1939. Did you marry again after that? Yes, indeed, I did. Hmm. I married then Mr. Philip John Harding. Now, I know what you're thinking and what the audience is thinking, that I should have had enough sense after two failed marriages to just stop doing that. But you must understand, and I'm saying this for the 21st century audience watching tonight, in my day, it was very unusual for a woman not to be married. And unless I wanted to be, heaven forbid, a spinster, I had to move quite quickly. Well, did this marriage work out? Of course not. <laughs> we divorced in 1945, and still having no sense, I married yet again to Mr. David Playdell Boovery. We divorced in, uh, and I had the sense, finally, to never marry again. Now, <laughs> I noticed that most of your husbands were involved in the arts. Mm -hmm. Were you interested in the arts, Alice? Well, I guess it can be safely said that I was more taken with the arts than I was with any of the men that I married. <laughs> <laughs> Did you practice art yourself? Well, mostly. I was a patron of the arts, although I did dabble somewhat with painting and sculpture. I, I adore dance above all other art forms. I suppose that if I were alive today, I would be encouraged to practice the arts. But in my day, women were educated in the arts just enough to make them desirable to a man. Ironically, I guess thinking about it now, if I had been what I was so afraid of being, a spinster, I might have been able to dance and dance and dance all the time. That's lovely, really oh, thank lovely. You. Thank and you. I, I find you fascinating and I totally enjoyed our interview. Oh. And before you leave, is there anything else you'd like to impart on our listening audience? Yes, indeed there is, Mr. Box. And I, I'd like to address this to the ladies who are watching this this evening. Now, I don't know how it is for women and girls these days, but I would like to say that it is terribly important for you to be yourself. No matter what society expects of you, and no matter who tells you to tamp it down and don't make any waves, and no matter who a man wants you to be, you must be yourself. You must work very hard and fight to be who you want to be. If you want to dance, then you must dance. If, if you want to be a doctor or a scientist or an astronaut, you must fight to be what you want to be. You will be very happy if you do that. Thank you for this Thank opportunity. You. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Thank you. Oh, that was much more than I expected. Delightful. I think I'm getting the hang of this. If I do this again, I would like to have her back as a guest. Women just didn't talk that way in my time. Which is unfortunate. Well, let's see. <clears throat> Our next guest is not situated in any specific time or place. She's from anywhere and everywhere. 
You could say that she's a light in the darkness, a spirit who crops up when we need her most. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next visitor. Hello. So let's begin with this question. What do people call you? They call me Abigail. Now I've been told that you travel. I travel, but not in the way you would think hmm. that one would travel. So tell me, Abigail, right? Right. What brings you here this evening? You, Mr. Vox. Me? Why me? Because I've, I've heard so much about you, and I heard that you were doing this, this show, and I had to come see you. <laughs> you must be joking. No, I, I, I am not joking, Mr. Vox. I have, I have seen your work, and I'm a big fan. Fan? Um, I'm confused, but I put my... No, let me let me let me try to to make more sense of this. All I, right. I apologize. I I don't necessarily travel physically. I travel more spiritually. And I have been to many of the places that you have contributed so much of your your talents over time. And I had to come meet the man behind all of this beautiful architecture. Well, thank you. I'm not accustomed to being uh, recognized or talked to this way. I, I put my heart and soul into my buildings and, and into my uh, designs. And, and I feel, uh, well, I don't feel, I know from what I've been told that in this day and age, it's modern day and age, that, that they're gone, that they're, that they're forgotten. No, Mr. Vox, I'm sorry. I, I believe you're speaking of the the psychiatric hospital that was in Hyde Park. I was there. I was there and I saw it and it was beautiful, but unfortunately now it is it is reduced to rock and rubble. No, no, yes, that cannot it, be. No, I, I'm so sorry to have upset you. That is not my intention, Mr. Fox. I, I merely came here to tell you how much you're appreciated and how I might be able to help you. Well, <laughs> I'm open to to suggestions, and when 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 I return to this, what people call the modern day, and I'm 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 confronted by someone from from your day and age, and and I'm told that that one of the, the hallmarks of my existence has been, has been demolished. I I am not from any time. I am from everywhere, Mr. Vox, and and I do apologize. I but I am here to help you with that. I, I can help. Well, thank have, you. And that's what, that's what brings you here. That Abigail. is what brings me here, Mr. Vox. I am here to hopefully bring some hope. And these, the times that we're in right now, they're very uncertain. And I am here to hopefully clarify that for a, a lot of, a lot of our, our viewers and, and your viewers here. But no. In doing my research for this interview, I, uh, not knowing who you were, uh, I, I stumbled upon a bit of information that there's some connection between you and uh, a 19th century establishment called the Beekman Arms. Yes. Oh, one of my favorite places to visit, Mr. Box, the Beekman Arms. I, if I may, can I share a story? Please do. Okay. Well, recently. I, I traveled to the Beekman Arms, which I have done many times over the centuries because it is one of my favorite places to go. And I met someone there. We exchanged a glance in the hallway. He looked at me, he was very kind. He smiled and he was smoking a cigar. And that is very important to the story, Mr. Box, that cigar, because I remember the smell of that cigar. How uncanny, and you were able to smell this person's or this presence uh, uh, cigar. It was a man. 
I saw this man in the hallway, and of course I would smell a cigar because he was standing right next to me. So. Well, well, who was that man, and, and did you see him again that no, night? No, I did not, and that's what puzzled me. So I spent the rest of the night looking for this man because something about him just stuck with me. And I had spoken to someone in the tavern behind the bar, and he said, oh, the man you're describing, that's Donnie. Everyone knows Donnie, but he's been dead for quite some time. And I didn't understand. If he was dead, how did I see him? How did I smell his cigar if he was dead? But he still lives at the Beekman Arms well, to this day. Do you know anything more about this Donnie? Who was he or why he chooses to stay at the Beekman Arms? He used to live there and he worked there too. And it was a very special place for him. So I guess in the hereafter, he. That is where he stayed. But it made me think. It made me wonder. Why would he stay there? Did he have anywhere else to go? Why does anywhere, why does anyone stay in one particular spot after they die? And that is why I'm here tonight, Mr. Box, to shed some light on that subject. Well, I, I can't, I can't quite answer that. I mean, I, I'm listening to this and, uh, I, I'm aware of the fact that, that you are untethered, that you are neither here nor there. Why do you choose not to spend your time in eternity at one single place? Why? To give others hope, sir. I would like to help people and help people to understand the hereafter and to bring some comfort to our, to our viewers here tonight, and to you as well, and to what happens, because we know what physically happens. It's, it's nature, it's science, it's what we've been taught, it's what we can see, what we can touch. That is what's real. We know what happens physically when we die, but we don't know spiritually what happens when we die. And that's why I'm here, to help to bridge that gap and to help you to understand and to hopefully bring some comfort with that. I see, I see. I think here, this could possibly better explain it. If we think of our lives and what's left after as right. the changing seasons, that might help. So we think of autumn, for example. Autumn is a perfect example. Everything is bright and vibrant and beautiful at that point. You could say that is the most beautiful time of the entire year, is autumn. The bright oranges, the bright reds, the bright yellows. But then comes winter. Winter is gray, winter is dark, and it's sad. And that is death. That is the, that is death and dying. Everything was so beautiful, but now it is nothing. But, as you have known in your lifetime, eventually the winter ends and we have the spring and it's beautiful and everything comes back to life. And that is how we can think of our lives. Think that our life right now, there is so much we have to offer. So right now is the autumn of our life and everything is bright and beautiful. But eventually, the winter will come for everyone. But if we hold on and we keep that faith that one day spring will return, just as, as the souls, everyone that you've ever loved and lost, they're still there just in a different form. They are in their own springtime waiting for you to come and join them. I wasn't expecting this. So, so what you're saying is that the soul does not perish. If, if winter is, represents death, then we await for spring, whether we're here or in the hereafter. Therefore, there is hope that I will be remembered. There's always hope that you'll be remembered. Even if your name is not remembered right now, when someone 
sees your work, sees the beautiful landscape and the beautiful architecture, they will think, who is behind this? And then they will learn your name, Mr. Vox, and you will live on forever. Well, thank you, Abigail. That is something that I've always hoped for. I never thought I would hear these words, but I, I thank you for your time and for uh, enlightening me and, and, and setting me on, on a hopeful course. You are very welcome, Mr. Vox. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you. A pleasure meeting you. Have a safe journey. Thank you. Pardon me, but I must partake of a refreshment as I ponder what I was just told. Well, here's to glasses that don't break and to souls that do not disperse and depart. <sighs> well, that was quite an experience. <clears throat> As an English gentleman, I'm I'm feeling quite rattled, but uh, I must I must move on for for your sake and uh, the sake of uh, enlightenment and entertainment. So, um, my next guest. I have it on good authority that we might have a visit from a president. Might! <laughs> Mr. President, is that you? Please enter, sir. Do you mind? You're giving me the willy, sir. I, I, I now, on top of everything else, I have a splitting headache. Oh, poor man. Shall I call a physician? No, 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 no. Um, uh, I have my own remedy here, sir. Why don't you have a seat and we'll, um... <laughs> certainly, certainly. Have a, have a conversation. How is oh, that? Oh, very good, very good. All I don't right. mind if I do. I prepared a, a few questions. Oh. Um, um, Fire away, sir. Well, um, uh, please sit down. Uh, certainly. Now, I have a, a wonderful introduction that I can't read now. I was going to present you with and give you a proper presidential introduction based on your life experiences, but I'm going to bypass that and allow you to introduce yourself to our audience. Oh, well, of course. Thank you. Hello. Ah, the American people. <laughs> I am Theodore Roosevelt. I was president of this great nation for eight rigorous years from 1901 to 1909. <laughs> A long time ago, I'm told, here in the hereafter. Astounding. Astounding. Now, if I am doing my mathematics correctly, you first became president six years after my death. Hmm. That means that our lives somewhat overlapped. Hmm. Now, um, what year were you born, Mr. Roosevelt? 1858. October 27th. But... Contrary to what you may believe, I did not burst forth into this world with my usual fervor. I was actually quite a sickly boy. You don't say. I do say. I suffered from severe asthma. In fact, this crisp upstate air would have worked wonders for my breathing. <laughs> if I lived in these parts, I might have recovered even more miraculously than I did. If I'd had the majestic mountains and the roaring river. <laughs> ah, it would have been a wonderful surrounding. <laughs> well, where did you grow up and where did you overcome your asthma? Lower Manhattan. I derived much strength from the place, the energy and the bustle of the city. <laughs> oh, I pushed and pushed and pushed until I recovered from my illness. People called it a miracle, but I called it 
perseverance. Um, with a strong will, a man can do anything. What a compelling statement, sir. Now, I overheard you say that you grew up in Lower Manhattan. Uh, would you mind telling us where exactly? Uh, 28 East 20th Street, a robust brownstone townhouse. Ah, of course. So you were in the vicinity of what we knew as uh, uh, the, the department store uh, uh, area called Ladies Mile. Yes, yes, uh, yes the Ladies yes. Mile. Yes, that was a. Uh, uh, I was actually two blocks south of the Flatiron Building. Uh, you know, the Flatiron Building was built uh, just one year after my sudden rise to the presidency. Well, Mr. President, why don't you tell us about your southern? A sudden rise to the presidency. Not sudden at all. It was quite, was quite a New York alive. event. So yes. I said it was. <laughs> I thought you would never ask. Well, that's why I'm here. Before I was president, I was vice president under William McKinley, who on uh, uh, September 7th, 1901, while delivering a speech at the World's Fair in Buffalo, New York, was shot in the abdomen. I was on my way to Mohonk Mountain House, which is right here in the Hudson Valley. So I simply rushed to his side, but despite all our best efforts to keep the man alive, he did pass away nine days later. It was a very, very sad day. But assuming the presidency shortly thereafter was the greatest honor of my life. You said that you were on your way to Mohawk Mountain House. Would you care to tell us why, sir? Uh, I thought you might notice that. <laughs> yes, well, I was on my way to Mohawk Mountain House to meet with the Board of Indian Commissioners to discuss the so-called Indian question. This, this issue was pressing heavily on my mind. Uh, just, just as I sought to better my body as a boy, I strive to make America invincible. I fervently desire to expand her powers by moving to the West. The question remains, what will we to do about the native people still living on the land? I believe that everyone deserved to enjoy the American dream and that the best solution was simply to have them assimilate into American culture. What was the approach of the uh, Board of Indian Commissioners? Well, it was uh, slightly different. A bit of a novel approach. Uh, it, what must be noted here was that the Smileys who founded the Mohawk Mountain House were Quakers and fervently defended the Native Americans' right to retain their culture. I found this very radical, the idea of weaving American Indians into American culture without having them adopt uh, the American way of life. That's absolutely fascinating. So what you're saying, Mr. President, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about <clears throat> the, the uh, experience I had with Olmsted in creating Central Park. So what you're saying does resonate with me, Mr. President. You see, um, as an well, architect, I, I was con confronted with very similar dilemmas, if I may say so. Uh, the area in Manhattan, which became Central Park, at one time was called Seneca Village, and it was an area with a very heavy black population, mm -hmm. although there were uh, some Irish <clears throat> immigrants living in that area. And um, unfortunately, the, <clears throat> excuse me, sir, <clears throat> the, the, the black population was uh, displaced mm. and, and relocated for the um, construction of, of, of the park, which, which to be honest, it disturbs me. And uh, all we wanted to do was, was to create a, a paradise, an area that would, would facilitate uh, communion with nature and, and escape from urban life. 
world. How did you acquire the land? Well, New York State put into effect a law that, um, let's just say, allowed the city to acquire the 775 acres, which was um, Seneca Village, which, which became uh, Central Park and the residents, uh, whether they were black or, or Irish immigrants, were uh, removed from the property and uh, displaced. Well, and they, were, they were simply, I'm sorry to say, were told to go elsewhere. Fascinating, fascinating. Mr. Box, I find this very fascinating. And, and you know, it makes me continue to wonder something I've often wondered is why, what, what it means to be a united country. Uh, you see, I always thought, uh, we talked about America as a, a melting pot. One people united together uh, as the American people, but the Smileys, as I was talking about, thought of the great nation as a salad bowl, a diversified whole that strive to unite uh, as uh, without doing away with cultural differences. But I find it fascinating that you and I have um, had to deal with very similar uh, dilemmas, despite the fact that I'm dealing with politics and you in architecture. Yes, yes. I didn't see this when I agreed to have a conversation with you, Mr. President, that my experience and dilemmas in uh, raising land and demolishing uh, communities would lead into anything political, but I, I see now that it mm. did. And I have to wonder if we had a, a third party sitting here with us, what he or she might say about this situation in this so-called modern era, mm. if anything at all has changed. Can't imagine. I can't either, sir. Wow. Well, maybe that's a conversation for another time. I feel that our time although it's coming to an end here, that it's, uh, it's been much too short. Oh, I feel like I could stay here for days and days, and we could discuss everything much further. But I must say, Mr. Vox, it has been a sincere pleasure. It has for me as well, sir. Adieu, adieu. Just don't blow that bugle again. Oh, you mean this? <laughs> Charge! Fascinating, fascinating character. If only he would lose the bugle. I did enjoy that conversation, and, and I hope you did as well. Oh, he is a character, an absolute multifaceted character. Wouldn't you agree? Hmm. Must say, that conversation went along swimmingly. Uh, I am a novice at this, but um, I'm starting to enjoy the, the format that we've uh, agreed to here this evening. Now, our next guest is also a colorful character in her own right. Now, she was a patron of the arts and a world traveler, and she lived locally in Ulster County, New York, until her death in 1964. Would you please? Give a warm welcome and allow us to hear and listen to Emily Crane Chadbourne. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming here this evening. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Mr. Box. You're quite welcome, quite welcome. I understand that according to my notes here that you were an art collector in your adult life. I was, yes. I collected a wide variety of art, Mr. Box. Art from many points in time and many places in the world. My first love has always been the French avant-garde. Oh, that's a, a, an interesting phrase. Would you mind telling us more about the French avant-garde? Certainly. I 
Well, I suppose I should mention that avant-garde literally translates to vanguard or advanced guard. Now, if you think about a military formation, the vanguard is the leading portion of that formation. These are the first soldiers who venture into new territory. When you think about avant-garde artists, they were similar, they were cultural pioneers. Through pushing the boundaries of artistic expression, they brought us into new territory. Does that make sense, Mr. Box? Conceptually, yes, but would you mind give us, just giving, uh, giving us some, some examples of what you're talking about? Of course. Well, I think immediately of my friends Pablo Picasso and Henry Matisse. They certainly pushed the boundaries of their day, mainly through rendering the human form abstractly. Now, some would call this unrealistic, but I, I take issue with that term. Artists in my day emphasized a different sort of reality. And what was that? the reality of each individual's experience. The artist, the avant-garde artist, put his or her perception at the center of her work. Hmm. I see. Now, you mentioned uh, a couple of your friends uh, who you said were leading artists in your time. I'm quite impressed with the, uh, the names that you mentioned. You. I wrote them down. And uh, tell us how you came to meet them. Oh, this is, this is a rather lengthy story. I will try to distill it as much as I can. I was an expat, Mr. Box. Since the year 1925, I spent 20 years abroad. I mainly split my time between Paris and London. Those years were the best years of my life. My European period, as I called it, and during that time, I amassed an incredible collection of art and donated much of it to the Art Institute of Chicago and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But to answer your question, Mr. Vox, I, when I was in Paris, I found myself operating in circles with artists such as Henry Matisse and Pablo Picasso and writers and poets as well, including the poet Gertrude Stein. She would throw the most wonderful parties, the most wonderful affairs. It was a meeting of the minds between the creative and cultural elite. And, oh, she was wonderful, I must say. Hmm. So that well, is how I came to meet. And how did you end up an expat, Mrs. Chadbourne? First of all, I would prefer it if you called me Miss Crane. My married name reeks of awful memories. Well, I, I'm very sorry. Um, I'm very sorry. Oh, Jane, no, I was simply no, no, trying no, to... No, 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 not to worry, Mr. Vox. I suppose that since we've breached the subject, I can divulge some of those experiences. I should mention beforehand, however, that I am originally from Chicago. I lived there from my birth in 1871 until the marvelous year of 1905, when I divorced my husband, Thomas Chadbourne. <laughs> Now, I, I should also mention that this marriage was unnatural from the start. It just felt so strange. You see, I never felt I fit the mold of a married woman. In fact, my sister claimed at the time of the divorce that the marriage did not work because I was no good at wifely duties. What was the reason the marriage didn't work? Well, my lack of domestic skills certainly didn't help the situation, but the real reason was because of Thomas's growing interest in his flashing Camellia, the wife of a dentist, for God's sake. I mean, she had a wonderful, pretty smile, but her intellect left much to be desired. She didn't give you a lot to sink your teeth into. 
Well, it seems as though uh, Thomas was chomping uh, at the bit. Did you ever read Mary? No. No, I did not. But I... I found a companion. What was his name? Her name, Mr. Voss. Her name was Ellen Lamott. Ellen Lamott? Yes. She was, she was an incredible individual. She was a writer. She was a nurse, a Johns Hopkins trained nurse, mind you. And she did nursing overseas during the First World War. She was an advocate for ending the opioid crisis in my day. She was a suffragist and, and she was my best friend. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And I'm, I'm, I'm very glad uh, that you found a companion. I am too, Mr. Vox. But may I, may I divulge to the, this audience I, I cannot see? When I told my, bro my brother about my, my bond with Ellen Lamont, well, I remember first writing a letter to my brother Charles about my recent com companionship with Ellen Lamott. Doing so made me feel riotously happy, but frightfully lonesome as well. I did not know how my family would respond to me, a divorcee, forming a close companionship with another woman. Yet, I thought of Gertrude and Alice, and they were, they got along beautifully. They lived beautifully. Yet, just the prospect of what possibly lay before me just terrified me. Yet, I felt this feeling, this urgency, palpable, looming. And as I signed my letter as Emily H. Crane instead of Mrs. Chadbourne, I was thrilled and filled with freedom. I had done it. I had chosen to live as truthfully as I could, Mr. Box. And I am so happy I did. Well, again, I, I thank you for the explanation and I repeat that I'm, um, very happy that you found a companion, Miss Crane. Now, I would like to, um, if you don't mind, I would like to move on um, and talk a bit about uh, the, the time that you spent living in Ulster County, New York, and your activities. I understand that you lived in the village of Stone Ridge. That is correct, Mr. Box. Ellen and I lived in a house called Tack Tavern, which, so I am told in the hereafter, is still standing. And uh, tell me how you spent your time while you were a resident of Stone Ridge and Ulster County. Art collecting, of course. I collected much American decorative art, which was quite a change from my usual French avant-garde focus. And I was also president uh, of the Senate House Board, if I do recall. And how did you spend your time during those years? Well, I spearheaded a great many public projects. There's one that I was particularly proud of, actually. I remember the year was 1943. And I recall reading an article in the Times about three tall bronze statues of Peter Stuyvesant, Henry Hudson, and George Clinton, and how these statues were being removed from the corn exchange in, in the city and deposited in a junkyard. Well, I thought this was unacceptable. So I rallied the troops, as it were, and we rescued those statues and installed them in a park called Academy Green in Kingston. I was massively proud of this. But upon visiting Academy Green, 
as I, as I came here from the hereafter, I decided to take a stroll by that park, and I'm astounded that this passed me by before in my lifetime, but I ask you, where are all the women statues? Where are all the lady statues? Do you know? How curious. Yes, Mr. Vox. Uh, as, you, as you might have guessed, I'm, I was a fervent suffragette, suffragist in my, in my day. And I understand you were alive for the Seneca Falls Convention, and I yes. do remember you stated that you passed in the 1890s, and unfortunately we did not earn the right to vote at that time, but in my lifetime, I assure you, we did. We were victorious. Well, I find it, uh, I find it surprising that the issue of suffrage was not resolved in your lifetime well, but it was, Mr. Vox, hmm. with the 19th Amendment. I'm not familiar with that. Hmm. It was the amendment that gave women the right to vote. And of course, that was a victory, but there's always more work to be done. We cannot become complacent. Well, I've learned a lot tonight, more than I anticipated, much more. And I, I do appreciate your time and for your enlightening and compelling words. Well, I thank you, Mr. Vox, for hosting me this evening. It was a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you. You are quite Thank welcome. you very much. Have a safe journey. Thank you. Well, I feel as though I'm, I'm a changed uh, man after this experience, or sh should I say a changed spirit. I did enjoy myself here this evening with our four guests and hope you did as well. I know that I've learned a couple of valuable lessons. First, I feel much better about my own work, even though some of the physical structures that I was engaged in designing are being demolished or have been demolished what does it matter? Uh, I, I, I lived a good life and I, I lived in an era that made a difference. So I will leave you with this phrase. I'm not sure who I can attribute it to, but I do know that it is true. History is the future. So I do appreciate you tuning in for this first chapter voices from the past and we hope to return again with a different host and a different set of characters but for now i thank you and a short word about the theater group that brought you this here this evening um as you know they're they've been struggling because of uh, uh an illness that has uh, permeated our our society or your society in this day and age and if you feel so inclined to to make a donation uh, please refer to murdercafe.net. I'm not quite sure what that means, but murdercafe.net will probably answer your questions. And I will leave you with that. And I will have a safe journey. And I hope all of your journeys are safe. Thank you for your time. Uh -huh.